Hey, everybody. Um, I, th I thought uh, when I started writing this that I had too little to say, but it, it turns out I had too much. So, so I apologize in advance for the disjointedness. As Pascal said, I've made this longer than usual because I've not had time to make it shorter. <laughs> Uh, a midlife crisis is a transition of identity and self-confidence that can occur in middle-aged individuals, typically 45 to 64 years old. The phenomenon is described as a psychological crisis brought about by events that highlight a person's growing age, inevitable mortality, and possible shortcomings of accomplishments in life. This may produce feelings of depression, remorse, and anxiety or the desire to achieve youthfulness or make drastic changes to their current lifestyle. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My name is Paul. <laughs> I was born in 1971, 48 years ago. Um, being, being 48 means that, actuarially speaking, and, and to check this, I pulled up the Social Security mortality table, which they charmingly call the life table. Um, and it turns out I've got 31.34 years left. So I am well over halfway there, where there is, well, the final destination, the end of the line, the last gasp. Um, I was surprised to find I was well over halfway there. Uh, it turns out the age at which the amount of years remaining equals the amount of years lived is actually 39 for men, 41 for women. So suck on that, 39 and 41 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out you're halfway dead. Um, anyways, I, I've lived about half my adult life, uh, 30 years, and I have half left. And there's something magical to a halfway point, like you know, travel halfway up the Gaussian curve it's all downhill from here. And, and those of you in the audience who've already experienced this portion of life's journey can testify this is the season when the aches and pains never quite go away. Uh, the first flights of children, the decline of parents. The, the scent of fall is in the air, the leaves are turning, the wind whispers in your ears, you're next. <laughs> but. But in order to get to the top of the curve, in order to look down in despair, you've got to climb that first half. And that's a trip of optimism, an accomplishment, and upward turned eyes. And the thing about being halfway is you can just as easily look either way. You, know, you can look forward to an uncertain future and back to an accomplished past. And here's the thing. I'm personalizing this a fair bit uh, because I feel like, by chance, my professional career has overlapped to a significant extent the most important years of the rise of open source. I think it's not just me grappling with life's middle passage, uh, open source is too. So if, like me, you're 48 or around it, when you started your career, software was a thing you bought in a box. This was true of everything from utility libraries to word processing software. You bought the box, and you took the cellophane off, and you used the software. And the point of monetization was pretty clear. Like You bought that box, and you owned it. And that was how software worked 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I was just a happy technologist working for the British Columbia government in a ministry. And in that role, 20 years ago, there was a system I wanted to build. And I saw a need I could address with a small application that would help my fellow government workers to do their jobs better. And all I needed to build it was some web technology, good old Perl in this case, and a database. Uh, and so my boss and I took a meeting with the director of IT. And he listened to my idea. And then he told us that the ministry standard database was Oracle. And so we'd have to run a procurement. And I saw my idea and enthusiasm literally wilt and die right there across his desk like a flower in a blast furnace. <laughs> and then he smiled. <laughs> and that, that pattern repeated. You know, finding the analysis I wanted to do wasn't supported unless we purchased the next license level. You know, finding the software we'd already purchased just didn't have the capability we needed at all. I wanted to do the work, right? I was willing to put in the time, and there were people who would be happy with the result. But too often there was an artificial no standing in my way. And it wasn't 
it wasn't a no, that's not possible. It was a no, that is not allowed. And it was galling. Um, and what brought me to the light was that old time open source religion. <laughs> I discovered it and I was saved. That old time open source religion is the sound of yes, right? There will be trials and there will be tribulations, but they will be your trials and they will be your tribulations. That is entirely within you to overcome them. Yes, do it. Yes, try it. Yes, fail or succeed on your own terms. We're a funny group of people. <laughs> yes? Like, what is it that we have in common? What's brought us all here into this room at this time? Well, open source software, but, but what about it? Right? I mean, there aren't wrench conventions for plumbers. <laughs> what, what's so compelling about open source software? Um, there's a social science experiment. Uh, it's called the ultimatum game. Uh, you've probably heard about it uh, or of it. Uh, there, there are two players, a proposer and a responder. The proposer is given a sum of money, like 100 bucks, and they're told to share it with the responder in any proportion he wishes. Like, and if the responder accepts the proposal, they both keep their shares. If the responder rejects the proposal, nobody gets anything. Uh, economically, the proposer should be able to propose any non-zero share to the responder, and the responder should accept it, because the responder will always be better off accepting, even if only a little better off. Like economically, something is always better than nothing. But humans don't respond <laughs> economically, right? If the proposer offers the responder too small a share, the responder will refuse and they will both walk away with nothing. Humans want things to be fair. And we don't just want them to be fair intellectually. Um, psychologists have been putting people in MRI machines uh, and having them play the ultimatum game. And they've observed the aggression centers of the brain actually light up when unfair outcomes occur. And the pleasure centers light up when fair outcomes occur. We are wired for fairness. Fairness makes us feel good, and unfairness makes us feel bad. When you're living in a small group of hunter-gatherers, scratching out a living in a rift valley, recipro reciprocity and fairness are not nice-to-haves, they are have-to-haves. Fairness makes us feel good. We are evolved for that. 20 years ago, the term open source was just a year old. And I've always liked the term because it disambiguates the confusion in English between free as a concept related to freedom and free as a price. But it's important to note the term open source was invented to make what was formerly known as free software more palatable to corporations. Uh, a recent article in Motherboard magazine put it, uh, the free software movement was burdened with a major ethical component, and ethics are bad for business. <laughs> ethics are bad for business. Uh, but they are hopefully a good thing that binds us together in this venture of ours. Ethical behavior, fairness that makes us feel good, that fairness that is good. 10 years ago now, I gave my first ever keynote uh, presentation at Foster G 2009 in Sydney, Australia. Uh, it was the first in what has turned out to be a decade-long biannual riff on the topic of open source economics, the latest to which I am delivering up here now. Um, by 2009, the writing was on the wall for proprietary shrink wrap software. Um, first, the technology industry was clearly moving to a 100% open source model for all software built on the web. And second, all future software was going to be built on the web. In 2009, uh, AWS offered just two services, EC2 and S3, and had just opened its first data centers in Europe. Companies were still buying servers. They were still running them in cold rooms which meant that a lot of people were still were installing a lot of open source and then wondering who to call when things went wrong. So in 2009 at FosterG, I talked about how open source software enables new business models, like an inversion of the old proprietary model, where customers exchange money in act, in ex, for access to closed intellectual property in the form of software, and then expect to receive support and ancillary services for free. A change to a new model, where customers get the open source software for free, but exchange the money for support and ancillary services. Uh, the premier company using that model, Red Hat Software, had at that time annual revenues of $670 million. Uh, the company I work at now, Crunchy Data, also using that model, wouldn't be founded for another three years. Um, so fast forward to today. 
Uh, if you're 28 years old today, then you have never known a time when you couldn't just Google the thing you need, download it, and start using it immediately. So open source isn't so much an option now as it is the oxygen that developers breathe. And yet, there are concerns. We are, we are in the middle passage. We have gone from strength to strength to strength. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We're all going direct to heaven, we're all going direct the other way. We're all going direct the other way. <laughs> So first, open source has serious sustainability problems. And second, related to the first, open source is a serious value problem. I think everyone has heard the term, uh, the tragedy of the commons. It's actually a relatively recent term from environmental science. Uh, but it refers to what happens when a lot of people share a finite community resource, uh, like a shared grazing area, a commons. Uh, if only a few people make use of the shared resource, it can regenerate itself. And the community can benefit from it forever. Um, but if everyone rushes in to graze it as hard as they can, it gets stripped down to bare earth and nobody can graze at all. Free digital goods are a weird case uh, because there is no upper limit to the number of people who can use a digital good. You know, just make another copy. So no tragedy. Let's all go home. Um, but open source projects are not digital goods entirely. They also encompass the community of developers and users. I hope it's not controversial to note that a project without developers has very little or no value anymore. So assessing the health or sustainability of a project mostly is about assessing the community of developers. Does it exist? How is it sized relative to the code base, relative to the user base? Uh, Nadia Eggball raised an interesting question on Twitter last month. She asked, what makes an open source project big? Um, it's really a tricky one. Uh, like, is it scope of use? Not necessarily. There's some extremely widely used projects like libcurl, uh, which has only one developer. Uh, is it lines of code? To the extent uh, a certain level of complexity is required for the utility needed to be big, but if nobody uses it, so what? Um, is it number of developers? This seems like the best gauge of a project's current vitality, if not its overall importance to the software world. I think a simple two-axis analysis gives us what we need. Just just ignore projects that don't have a wide scope of use. Um, put widely used projects on the graph based on their code complexity and the size of the community. So big projects in the upper right quadrant are doing well right now. You know, Linux, Kubernetes, Hadoop, Postgres. A lot of these are infrastructure projects that align with the needs of the major internet companies. You know, they're complex, they're capable, and they're maintained. Projects with low complexity and small development teams are not a huge worry because the low complexity means it's easy to swap them in and, and replace them. Like the canonical example of the, this would be the left pad NPM module. I don't know who remembers the left pad <sighs> event. Uh, so left pad was a JavaScript module, did literally one thing. It padded out the left side of a string with spaces. <laughs> Naturally, you'd want to modularize that. Uh, a surprising number of JavaScript projects ended up declaring a dependency on left pad instead of just writing their own 10-line function. And then one day, the author of left pad pulled it out of the NPM system, and every project downstream unexpectedly broke. <laughs> so it ended up being like a one-day wonder, because it's really easy to replace. It's a small piece of code. Um, project with low complexity in large communities, I'm not sure what those are. Um, maybe core Unix command line utilities. It's a, that's a weird combination of variables. But projects with high complexity and small development teams. Uh, these are either projects that started out with a large team and then got small suddenly, um, or projects that have had a very long life and lots of opportunity to accrete lots of code with a small continuous team. Uh, the first category includes abandonware projects, uh, or projects where a large corporate team got retasked when the company changed priorities. And sometimes this is a death warrant, warrant uh, but sometimes it's the start of something new. Like in our own space, I think about MapGuide open source, uh, which hasn't fully recovered from the withdrawal of Autodesk. On the flip side, uh, Postgres actually flirted with abandonware status when Michael Stonebreaker ended this, the Berkeley Research Project back in the mid-90s. But instead of disappearing, it was picked up by a non-academic community and nursed back to the robust health we see today. So there's no, there's no guarantee that a big project 
losing its team necessarily means that it goes away. The second category includes some of the most important code on the internet. Uh, the canonical example is OpenSSL, in which a lack of maintenance resources led to a catastrophic heart bleed vulnerability a couple years ago. This is costed out in the multiple billions. And our own ecosystem, the GDAL library, is huge. It's complex. It's immensely important. And it has a full-time maintainer community of one. The PROJ library, uh, the GIS libraries are similarly foundational and similarly under-resourced. In her review of open source sustainability, uh, Roads and Bridges, which is well worth your read, uh, Nadia Agbal highlights the importance of digital infrastructure and the key concern of sustainability. So she says, the financial support for digital infrastructure is much harder to come by. Currently, any financial support usually comes through sponsorships, direct or indirect, from software companies. Now, there's nothing wrong with sponsorship, but the key fact we have to wrestle with is that most funding of open source software is perceived of and often communicated as charity. Uh, after the Heartbleed incident, OpenSSL is no longer underfunded. It has a couple full-time paid maintainers because the big internet companies got together and they put together a charitable fund, the core infrastructure initiative, to make sure the projects that they deemed critical received funding. Imagine if our airline safety inspectors were funded as a charitable act of the aerospace companies. Oh, wait. They are. You don't have to imagine that. <laughs> Suffice it to say, I don't think that charity is necessarily the best funding model. It's not that people don't have good intentions. It's there's just not enough people with good intentions. Um, in our geospatial world, there have been a number of crowdfunding efforts to try and marshal the small charitable impulses of our user communities into larger lump sums, big enough to fund non-trivial improvements to core code. Um, I ran an early one in 2005 to raise 10 grand to add concurrency to the post spatial index. It was a lot of work. It raised a little money. Um, different organizations and individuals around QGIS have run crowdfunding programs for numerous pieces of functionality. New plugins, 3D support, that kind of thing, with dollar figures ranging from a couple thousand to a few tens of thousands. Uh, one of the largest in our community recently, Google Barn, uh, Howard Butler ran last year, raised $140,000 for core upgrades to Google and Proj to support modern coordinate referencing needs. It was a huge amount of work on Howard's part. It raised a moderate, one-time sum, enough to support a talented developer for about a year. No more. The thing that strikes me about all these efforts, um, which are still mostly just charity fundraising drives in their form and appeal, is just how minuscule the funds are, particularly compared to the aggregate value the projects deliver to their user communities year after year after year. So for an order of magnitude comparison, my home province, British Columbia, which is just one jurisdiction of 4.8 million people, spends about a million dollars a year on Esri desktop support, or Esri support alone. Um, not on new licensing, right? This is just on support for existing licenses. This is money that's applied to the kinds of maintenance work and new feature development that the open source community has to beg for $1,000 at a time. Apropos of nothing, BC also spends about $10 million a year on Oracle software support. It's normal. It's regularized. You know, government understands the value it is buying. And it pays without complaint, or even oddly, a great deal of expectation. Now, Esri and Oracle, they don't grovel and scrape and say, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. Dear government, they say, we'll send the next invoice in 12 months. Open source provides tremendous amount of value to traditional organizations like governments, to the new companies building services and platforms in the cloud, and it captures almost none of that value. And the problem of value capture is getting worse. And that's not even the worst news. Um, so Harvard business guru Clayton Christensen posits a law of conservation of attractive profits. Uh, the law states that when modularity and commoditization cause attractive profits to disappear at one stage of the value chain, the opportunity to earn attractive prof profits with proprietary products will usually emerge at an adjacent stage. And you can see that law. You can see it play out in technology over the years in where the big profits were earned. In the mainframe, the early mini computer days, the hardware and the software, they were bundled together. And the vendor made both, and they got all the value in the sale of the bundle. And the computer software combination, that was the customer solution. And the default question was, does this computer software bundle solve my problem? 
And when the PC came along, IBM outsourced the operating system, which turned out to be a huge mistake because the company they chose, Microsoft, strategically cut the computing bundle in half. And the hardware half, owned by IBM, became a commodity as PC clones flooded the market, but the software half, owned by Microsoft, became the point of value. And the default question became, does this software solve my problem? And the hardware was subordinated to the software. When open source came along, in conjunction with internet delivery, the value of the operating system and associated infrastructure fell to zero. We're playing this out now. But the value has migrated again. Internet services are built with free software, and the default question becomes, does this service solve my problem? And what's under the service? Customers don't particularly care. But the answer is open source software. There is a lot of money in computing. It's billions of dollars. But the people writing the code that runs the internet economy don't have access to it. And the particularly ironic aspect of this is that we don't have access to that value on purpose. We chose the development terms, openness and freedom, that have simultaneously led to an explosion of wealth on the internet and to our powerlessness to access the value that we created. So the world we live in is one where the reward goes largely to the people delivering the software to end users, not the people writing the software. Well, I'm sorry, but I need to beat this horse fully to death. <laughs> so, uh, Amazon Web Services sells raw compute power in EC2 instances of various sizes and capabilities. They also sell a database as a service uh, in what they call RDS instances. And I was curious, what is the difference in price between a bare EC2 instance and a Postgres RDS instance with the same capability? So a modern mid-range EC2 instance, the DB M5 large, will cost you 9.6 cents an hour. An RDS instance of the same size will cost you 17.8 cents an hour. So the premium AWS is capturing from providing the open source software with the compute over just providing the bare compute is 8.2 cents per hour. This is value AWS is capturing directly from Postgres. Over a year, over 10,000 RDS instances, that's 7 million bucks a year. And with that kind of money, AWS could easily employ all 28 Postgres committers. As it happens, they employ one, uh, which, to be honest, is one more than I thought they employed. <laughs> uh, Google and Microsoft also offer Postgres database as a service in their clouds. Neither employs a Postgres committer. Most of the companies at the top of this list, um, Enterprise DB, Crunchy Data, Second Quadrant, Postgres Pro, SRS, their companies in the model of Red Hat, um, enterprise-oriented, open-source support companies, they do pretty well. They capture some of the value of the growing ecosystem of companies deploying Postgres, and they funnel that value back into the software. This is, in most respects, a good news story. But let me get back to Red Hat. So in 2009, Red Hat had revenues of $670 million. Uh, in 2009, the brand new AWS had revenues of about $210 million. Now, 2019, AWS has revenues of over $25 billion, and Red Hat has revenues of about $3.4 billion. So these are two businesses built from the ground up on open source. So do you see where the value is being captured? Do you know what else is being captured? Here's a true statement. Cloud software as a service is really convenient. It's really powerful. It does amazingly useful things for an enterprise and enables new, more effective software architectures. Everyone should use it. Now put yourself in the time machine, go back 20 years, and replace Cloud software as a service with Oracle. Reread the statement. Oracle is really convenient. It's really powerful. It does amazingly useful things in the enterprise. It enables new, more effective software architectures. Everyone should use it. In 1990 terms, that is still a true statement. Oracle was better than the desktop junk from Microsoft or old school mainframe terminal apps. It opened the way to network oriented two and three way architectures. It was good, good stuff. But it was also a trap. Right? Back in the bad old days of buying software in a box, vendors would ensure that you didn't change to an open source alternative or even a competing proprietary option you know, by saving your data in a secret format or something like that. This is naturally done in the interests of performance or security or magic. But 
But the real net effect was always clear, is the elevation of the vendor need for predictable revenue over the customer need for flexibility and freedom. And now it's happening again. Enterprises are tying themselves to identity management in AWS, Azure, and Google, they're storing their data in Salesforce. They're managing their data flows by scripting between Google Docs and MailChimp and SurveyMonkey. The web APIs of proprietary online services are becoming the equivalent of the Win32 API 20 years ago. It's just so darn convenient, right? And it's the trend. Everybody's doing it. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Open source has never been stronger. Open source has never been weaker. Standing as I do at the pinnacle of my own midlife, uh, the question I ask myself is, is it all downhill from here? And of course the answer is no, no. I can frame the next 20 years as the antithesis of the past 20 years, 20 years of decline. Or I can frame the next 20 years as the natural successor of the previous 20, act two. You know, the outlines of the story are set, but the payoff is still to come, maybe with a twist, but more of the same won't do. There's lots of room for fun in something new. The same is true of open source. Like more of the same won't do. Um, open source has marched through and demolished the value proposition of boxed proprietary software, and even built whole new software categories in the big data space. But there's some new paths open source must tread in order to avoid a future of vendor cloud lock-in. Um, we used to click through licenses that told us how we could and could not use our computers. And we knew there was something wrong. They were our computers. Right? The license wasn't fair. And now we click through licenses that tell us how the service we use will sell our personal data. And we know there's something wrong. It's our data. The license isn't fair. We know a fair deal when we experience it. It makes us feel good. We are evolved for it. If we want to get out from under the coming cloud monopolies, we're going to have to build out alternatives, open alternatives. Um, for the last 20 years, open source advocacy has involved a strong emphasis on ensuring that decision makers understand the value of the three opens, open source, open standards, and open data. And I think the three opens have never been more important, and they're still applicable. Is your organization considering a new cloud service? Can all the data be downloaded using an open standard? Can you authenticate with it using an open standard? Is there a competitor using those same standards? Is there an open source analog that uses those standards? We need to build a much stronger bias in, towards openness into our technology decisions. Still, the battle is not yet won. It is the best of times. It is also the worst of times. Governments in particular are in an excellent position to seed new open source revolution up the value chain. We've done software. We're doing applications. We need to get to user-facing services. It's really weird um, how governments look at their systems. Like, do the business requirements of the California DMV differ substantially from those of the Nevada DMV, the Idaho DMV? I'm willing to bet they all wrote their own systems or bought their own systems. Why does it fall to the private sector? Why does it fall to private sector companies to figure out the commonalities between government use cases and then hawk the same COTS solution to each state? Right? Could there be a more colossal failure of imagination on the part of government technologists? Those guys kind of do the same thing as we do. In the geospatial world, why do we depend on Google or Esri for our geocoding and routing? when governments collectively hold so much of the data necessary to provide those services. Open source, open data, open standards. The digital services movements in government, the US Digital Service, the Canadian Digital Service, UK GDS, here the California Office of Digital Innovation, they've done a great job at making use of open source components, made that a best practice in the projects they manage and the ones they incubate, but that's not enough. You know, the next frontier for those agencies has got to be encouraging the kind of cross-jurisdictional collaboration we need to generate the next wave of open source value at the next tier in user-facing services. Imagine open source land management applications and standards so our public resources are managed with public tools. You know, open source transportation network software so the interface to our public transit systems remains public. 
you know, our roads shouldn't be owned by Uber. Open source electronic health records, so our most personal data isn't at the mercy of private corporations. The last 20 years of open source have been an unparalleled success. Uh, but open source victory over the old shrink wrap proprietary model has just morphed into a new battle with a new set of companies. Companies that ironically are built on open source foundations but have the same economic incentives as the last lot to lock in their customers and then abuse their market position once they have it. And the last wave of proprietary software took over our computers. The next wave of proprietary services can take over our data and our networks too. And the open source community can't stop this alone. We can provide the tools, we can build examples, we can share our knowledge about how to build open and decentralized and fair technology. But we're going to need help from lawmakers and decision makers and everyone else, technical or not, who wants to see fairness be the rule in the technology we use every day. We're at the midpoint, and the journey isn't finished. It can be the best of times, it can be the worst of times. Let's make it the best. Thanks.